young and some seasoned, gifted, intelligent, beautiful HBCU students and alumni. I have to stop first because I have something to get out of the way. Anybody from Tuskegee here? Wee! Oh, yeah. Do you? You know? <laughs> it is such an honor to see so many historically black college and university students eager to attend law school and enter the legal profession. As many of you know, I graduated from one of the most prestigious HBCUs, Tuskegee University, for this university for the past 135 years has produced some of the finest world-inspiring thought-provoking minds in the country. While I undoubtedly believe that TU is the best HBCU out there, I have to admit that no matter what HBCU you attend, there is no experience like an HBCU experience. HBCUs prepare you well, and you all need to know that you are ready to take on the world. Which is why, before I go any further, I must extend my sincere appreciation to Evangeline Mitchell, founder and executive director of the National HBCU Pre-Law Summit. Thank you, where is she? Is she in here? Thank you for your unparalleled commitment to encouraging and empowering HBCU students and graduates interested in going to law school and becoming attorneys, providing resources and connections to assist them in preparing for the challenges that they, you all have yet to obtain through your journeys the journeys ahead of you, to the aspiring lawyers and soon-to-be law students. You can do it. Take advantage of the resources and the opportunities that are presented to you today. With all of the negativity that's happening in our world today, I need not remind those of you in this room of the importance of collectively organizing, identifying, strategizing, and empowering the next generation to act and to do something about what we are mutually experiencing in this country as African Americans. Empowering the next generation of leaders in our community is so crucial in the progress of our nation. You see, when we look at our history, every great movement toward progress began with young people unafraid to challenge the status quo in the pursuit of justice. Young people unafraid to, in the words of Harriet Tubman, reach for the stars and change the world. Young people who acted within that exact moment. Young people who never let any time, situation, or circumstance define their <coughs> destiny. Young people who transformed into leaders by channeling their pain into their passion and pursuing their God-given purpose. Not tomorrow, but today. Now, in this very moment. Taking complete advantage of the awesome power of now, an ideology shaped by and taught by every prolific leader throughout our history. At 35 years of age, I'm the youngest chief prosecutor of any major American city in the country. Now, when I decided to run for this position, I embarked on a journey that was not easily rooted in an abundance of external support. <coughs> I sat down with any and every politician, business owner, community, and clergy leader to ask for their guidance and support in my endeavor. To my dismay, an overwhelming majority of those discussions ended with optimism for my vision, but skepticism in my ability to carry out my vision. Most of these skeptics went as far as to even discourage me from running for this office in the first place. And whether their skepticism was rooted in love or hatred, I was told over and over again that now was not my time. I was told that my dream was impossible. I was told that I was too young, that I was too inexperienced, that I couldn't raise enough money that me potentially running for this position as a young black woman against a powerful white male incumbent with the ability to outrace me close to a million dollars, that it would not only interrupt but potentially destroy my husband's career. The skeptics wanted to know, how could I have the audacity? After thinking long and hard about the skepticism of the cynics, I thought about the audacity of those fearless and courageous leaders woven throughout our history, such as Thurgood Marshall, Rosa Parks, Charles Hamilton Houston, Dorothy Irene Height, Merle Evers Williams, Congressman John Lewis, Fannie Lou Hamer, President Barack Obama, <coughs> all of whom have been unwavering in their pursuit of justice and equality. Having the audacity to believe in myself, I realized that I had to channel my confidence and deflect the negativity of ageism, sexism, and racism, and ultimately decide that as a wife and a mother raising two little girls in the heart of West Baltimore,
Baltimore, a woman of faith, a former prosecutor with six years of prosecutorial experience and an overall 80% conviction rate, that I not only possess the vision, but the passion and the foresight to reform this system. With my passion in mind, I realized that my desire to change a system that has historically and disproportionately affected so many communities of color far outweighed the force of any skepticism. Reflecting upon my faith and my life experiences, I had to make a decision that my dream would not be deferred, that my dream could not be deferred. When I reflected upon the audacity and the courage of those who have come before me, like Booker T. Washington, who in 1881 created what we now know of as Tuskegee University, so that our forebears could rise up from slavery and turn their dreams of self-discovery and the drive for self-determination into reality. Think about that. In 1881, Booker T. Washington's dream could not be deferred. And when I considered his courage at a time when few institutions of higher learning were built and existed in a more hostile environment towards notions of black empowerment, I concluded that I needed to leverage the awesome power of now and run for Baltimore City State's attorney. But first, I had to get past the skeptics and the naysayers that tried to impose self-doubt. As African Americans in this country, there are so many times throughout our lives where we will have to channel our confidence in order to get past the self-doubt that's imposed by others that are seeking to defeat you for reasons beyond your control, for reasons that have everything to do with the color of your skin. But much like the spirit of Booker T. Washington, you have to remember, I have begun everything with the idea that I could succeed and never had much patience with the multitudes of people who are always ready to explain why one cannot succeed. Unbeknownst to the skeptics, the depths of my conviction and my passion to succeed was because of them. Looking at the plight of our communities and the unparalleled destructive impact of the criminal justice system, I decided that I could not pass my grandparents' fight on to my children's children. You see, from slavery to Jim Crow to the industrial prison complex, there comes a point when we must decide that enough is enough and that when God provides you with a purpose, he wants you to walk in that purpose. I ask myself, if not me, then who? If not now, then when? Throughout the journey of my campaign, as my skills and my qualifications, my personal life experiences were rigorously critiqued and questioned, just when the criticism, the naysayers and the haters began to permeate my conscience, I was reminded of the biblical verse, Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I walked in God's purpose for my life, and on June 24, 2014, I won the Democratic nomination, where I beat an incumbent that outraised me four to one by double-digit percentage points. Mm. There was no sense of outrage. 
I couldn't comprehend why this sort of violence was so common among our communities and why we collectively as a community have become so numb to hearing about yet another black boy killed in the streets by yet another black boy. This traumatic and painful event espoused my passion. This was my first introduction to the criminal justice system, and for the first time, I was intrigued to see how many African American young men were affected and impacted by the criminal justice system. At 14 years old, I wanted to know how we could have gotten to that young man before he elected to take my cousin's life. So, little to say, I turned my pain into my passion to reform the system. Imagine my dismay when I graduated Tuskegee University, magna cum laude with a 3.8 GPA, and was waitlisted to every single law school that I applied to because I didn't perform as well on the LSAT. My faith, once again, was being tested. So when I had to think outside of the box, it was a fellow Tuskegee student that suggested that I call and request interviews so that I could assure admissions directors that my LSAT score was not indicative of my potential. Well, I was told it was hopeless. It was a fruitless effort not to do it. They clearly, now is not your time, just try again next time. But when your faith and your purpose is real, you know when you must walk in God's purpose for your life. Little to say, I did not listen to the naysayers, and I got into my first choice law school. Then after successfully graduating from a top 25 law school, my faith was tested yet again when I did not initially pass the bar exam. Having gone through the pain of disappointment, I realized through that experience that failure is never fatal. I could have easily given up. I could have readily chosen a different path. I could have justifiably allowed the guilt, the shame, the pain, the trauma of life experiences to define who I am. But like so many of you in this room, when life happens, you can trust God. With God in the midst of it all, I became relentless in my pursuit to walk in his purpose for my life. I was determined that I would prevail, that I would one day become a top prosecutor and exercise my discretion to apply justice to those impacted by crime fairly and equally, to get to our children before they get to the criminal justice system, and to holistically attack a system that has consequently become the new Jim Crow. I was determined to win, and I did. Those memories, those experiences are real and vivid and sit on the tip of my mental cognizance because it's those memories that force me to never give up, never take no as a last answer, never to allow my purpose to be subdued or defined by another person's vision of me. You see, today, I stand before you the benefactor of the courage and the wisdom of our ancestors who have paved the way for me, who have paved the way for each and every one of you, courageous people in the past and in the present, who have and continue to make the ultimate sacrifices to put each and every one of us in a better position in our lives. Harriet Tubman, a woman born in the 1800s, is one of the greatest civil rights advocates in American history. Not only did she escape freedom for herself, but she returned multiple times, risking her life, threatening to take other lives in the name of freedom to rescue dozens of others from slavery. I stand on her shoulders, and I tell you my story, not to brag or to boast. I tell you my story because I recognize that I got to where I am today, not for my own doing, but because of the blood, sweat, and tears, and sacrifices of those audacious and courageous leaders and men and women who have come and lived their lives by example for each and every one of us. We, as HBCU students and alumni, we got to where we are today because of our institutions. They have and they will prepare us to navigate the, obstacle, the obstacles of life. 17 years ago, when I left the confines of a single parent household in Boston, Massachusetts as an 18-year-old first-generation college student and walked onto the beautiful historic campus of Tuskegee University, wide-eyed and eager, ready to make a mark, I didn't know it then, but the people that I met, the classes that I took, the places that I went, the professors that I learned from, not only shaped my consciousness, my confidence, my spirit, and my being, those experiences forever changed my life. It was at Tuskegee University that I met the love of my life. It was at Tuskegee University that I cast my first vote and obtained my first email address. It was at Tuskegee University that I lived through the horror of 9-11. It was at Tuskegee University that I watched a 2000 presidential vote scandal play out in the United States Supreme Court, resulting in the appointment of President Bush. It was professors at Tuskegee that helped put these monumental real-world events into context for me. 
These professors, among others, made us as students aware that we did not have to sit and watch the world go by. It was at Tuskegee that I realized that we, as the next generation, and byproducts of the legacy of our forefathers, not only have the ability, but we have an obligation to stand up and be a part of writing our country's history. Having now accomplished what others say could not be done, I fully appreciate in the words of Booker T. Washington, success is to be measured not so much by the position one has reached in life, as by the obstacles which he or she has overcome. All too often in our communities, when we feel we've obtained a level of success, we want people to see where we are and not how we got to where we are. But we must cast our shame, our pride, our guilt, our egos aside, and we must continue to pass our testimonies, our tried and tested journeys, onto the generations coming behind us. We must utilize the stories of our lives to change a chapter in someone else's life. Those trials, those tribulations, those pathways of life that God has brought us through to arrive at his purpose can inspire someone coming behind us who all too often in this day and age are going through far worse. Success is still attainable for these young people and those of us who are relatively successful must constantly remind ourselves that our success is the byproduct of the fruits of someone else's labor. And that true individual success is just not, not what we have obtained, but rather what we have done to put others in a position to obtain greater. This is what Evangeline envisioned two years ago when she started the HBCU Pre-Law Summit. You see, the critical importance of this forum for HBCU students is essential to not only ensuring the advancement of diversity and the elimination of disparities among minorities in law school and the legal profession, but from the perspective of a prosecutor and one in the pursuit of reforming the criminal justice system, the need for people of color in the courtroom is crucial to reform. When you consider the fact that 95% of prosecutors the individuals that make the ultimate decision about who will or will not be charged, who will or will not go to jail, are white. The prosecutors, 79% of them are white men. You start to understand the power of discretion and the impact of the injustices that so ever clearly still present their strongholds on communities of color. According to the Bureau of Justice, one in three black men will go to prison in their lifetime. According to the Prison Policy Initiative nationwide, blacks are six times more likely to be incarcerated than whites. In the 43 years since the Bureau of Labor Statistics started tracking unemployment data by race, black unemployment has been on average 66% higher than that of whites. In a study of test scores of school-aged children between 1990 and 2007, our children trailed white children by 28 points in academic performance. And as recently as 2009, 11 states with felony disenfranchisement policies effectively reduced their African-American voting populations by more than 10%. To date, in Baltimore City, there have been 246 homicides, up more than 52% from last year. 92% of those killed were black. 87 were black males. Non-fatal shootings, mostly young people, shot in the streets of Baltimore, 488 people in nine months. We're losing in every sense of the word. The violence that plagues my city doesn't go unnoticed or unreported by the media, but what isn't in the headlines is that the median in household income of white residents in Baltimore are more than twice that of blacks. The unemployment rate for young black men between 20 and 24 is more than twice as high than that of whites. My city has a record 16,000 vacant buildings, 14,000 vacant lots, most of which are in poverty-stricken neighborhoods. 24% of Baltimore's population is living in poverty, with 35% of children living below poverty. 150 years after the abolishment of slavery, 61 years after Brown versus Board of Education, 50 years after the termination of Jim Crow and the enactment of the voting rights, the systemic and structural barriers to progress, they continue. We need us, more of us, young people challenging the legal barriers to progress. We need each and every one of you. We as the next generation of change makers stand on the shoulders of greatness so we have to stop being immune to the violence that is robbing the next generation of black men and leading them to either prison or to a grave. 
It's time for us to individually and collectively get out of our comfort zones, be courageous, organize, strategize, protest, mobilize, and get off the sidelines and get into the game of life, the game of progress. Young people, it starts with you. You in this room, it starts today. Go on, get your education, get those degrees, go to law school, you can do it, you should do it, we need you to do it. We cannot wait for institutional racism and systemic inequality to cure itself. We cannot let our children get swept up in the school to prison pipeline. We are losing a generation. We as a next generation and byproducts of the legacy of our forefathers, we stand on the shoulders of those Hall of Fame honorees tonight. Judge Arthur Burnett, John Crump, James Douglas, Charles Holmes. The awesome power of now interjected with, with those who have come before us have instilled in us, calls on us. Whether in Baltimore, Chicago, or California, we must take a national stand, get to our young people, and redirect the trajectory of the next generation before it's too late. Dr. Martin Luther King. when he said, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. There is no time for apathy or complacency. This is only a time for vigorous and positive action. Young people, our time is now. The time to act, to get engaged in the political process, to vote, to run for office, to shape social policy, economic policies to become part of the solution to transforming the state of our communities. It begins with you. It begins today. Go to law school. Don't let anything or anyone stop you. Fulfill your dreams. Ladies, it starts with us. Our time is now. As women, we must step up, get past our self-doubt, not be ashamed to share our testimonies to save our young black sisters. We must be an example for the young women coming behind us letting our young sisters know that despite what they see on reality TV, fashion magazines, or in music videos, respect for their bodies and their mind is what makes them beautiful. We must instill in our young women that they can succeed at anything that they put their minds to, despite what the critics will tell them. They can and should aspire to be the next Serena Williams, Bree Newsom, Kamala Harris, or Paulette Brown. Ladies, our daughters, sisters, nieces, our young girls are watching. So we must live our lives and be example for them. And it begins with the men that we choose to love. When you love, respect, and honor yourself first, you'll choose someone who will do the same and will push you beyond your own self-expectations. Fellas, we must now ensure that our young boys know, despite what they see in the media, they are not thugs. And they are so much more intelligent, talented, and beautiful than what the media portrays of them. Gentlemen in this room, we must reaffirm for these young men that they are not a statistic. So many of you in this room are already living examples for these young men. Be the example for them. Love, respect, and honor the women in your lives. These young boys are watching. You need not be reminded because you are living examples that you are kings and more powerful united than you are divided. Our communities, our families, our women, our children, we need you now more than ever. In the words of Theodore Roosevelt, we must instill in our young people, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again. Because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms with great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best in the end knows the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Proud HBCU students and alum, our institutions have prepared us well. We do not know defeat and our time to claim victory is now. As you can see, we have work to do on behalf of our communities. 
which is just as important today <coughs> as it was 150 years ago. The battle lines and the cast of characters may have changed, but turn on the news, open up the newspaper. The struggle remains. The struggle continues. We have work to do, and the time to do it is now. No one is more uniquely positioned to solve the problems faced by people of color and the economically disadvantaged than the leaders in this room tonight. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? Don't wait, show up, show out, stay encouraged, because our time is now. Thank you.